Hello, everyone. My name is Paula Nebs, and I'm the lead for the Center for Living Organ Donation. Thank you very much for joining us today for this special webinar on who is eligible for liver transplant in Manitoba. We have our two experts joining us, Cheryl Berrio, who is a pre-liver and ketolimbal stem cell transplant coordinator at the Ashmara Transplant Center, and David Peretz who is a director of the liver transplant program in Manitoba and also specializes in gastroenterology and hepatology. We will review the HSC UHN liver transplant program, signs and symptoms of liver disease, indications for transplant, pathways to liver transplantation, the assessment process and surgery and life after. I will now turn it over to David to review the program in Manitoba. David? Thank you, Paula, for the invitation to speak on this obviously very dear and important topic to me. Here in Manitoba, as many may know, we perform kidney transplants, but our liver transplants are performed with our colleagues in Toronto. <clears throat> now, Everything outside of the surgery, we are managing. That means in the pre-liver transplant clinics, which are at Health Science Center, we evaluate patients who may potentially benefit from a transplant. And just to, to a word on the topic, which is who is eligible, we try... The word eligible is a bit a bit confusing because it's really what I tell people in clinic is who would benefit from a transplant. So we evaluate patients who would benefit from a transplant, and certainly this is a high-risk procedure. We work them up, and sometimes it could take a significant amount of time, several months, depending on the complexity of the case as to whether they may, again, ultimately benefit from a transplant. And once they're on the list, we continue to follow them closely up until the time of their surgery. Now in the post liver transplant clinic, so when they come back from Toronto and have their surgery, this does require long-term care. Uh, and we are uh, specialized at doing that. And we have a very dedicated support staff and doctors and uh, uh, clinical assistants who are involved in this. As I said, the, the, the surgery itself is performed at the uh, Mera Transplant Center at the Toronto General Hospital, the University Health Network in Toronto. Next slide, please. Uh, so as I said, Toronto is really the largest transplant program in Canada. It has excellent outcomes. And what we tell people is uh, there's two, uh, two options uh, of getting a transplant. One is living donation and one is deceased donation. They happen to be a very, very strong and, and a program with regards to living donation. They've done over a thousand living donor transplants since 2000. Uh, they provide follow-up care uh, for more than 2000 patients and they have a great track record, not only um, clinically, but also academically. And they're uh, compassionate experts and they really have very strong work ethics. And we work very closely together, both uh, Manitoba and, and Toronto. There's many types of liver disease, and this is really doesn't, does not give it enough emphasis, but some, some indications for transplants include hepatitis, and there's hepatitis B or C. There's other causes of hepatitis. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a growing indication. Cirrhosis due to alcohol is another growing indication. We have a new area as far as who might be benefiting and eligible for, for, for a transplant. And the six month rule that we've used to adopt historically is not more the absolute requirement, although we encourage people to be, of course, completely sober um, and they do have to complete the dedicated program to ensure that they would not jeopardize their graft. 
Primary sclerosing gyrus is another common autoimmune indication, mm. and more growingly cancer, in particular hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, is, is a very common indication for liver transplant. Next slide. So who should be referred? In general terms, uh, the patients who should be referred are not necessarily the ones who are going to be listed, although many We, we obviously prefer having more referrals than less referrals because that is really the funnel and the rate limiting step for somebody to get on the liver transplant waiting list. If you or your doctor feels that you should be considered for a liver transplant, a referral is made to the Health Science Center. And as a general rule, most Patients who are referred have chronic liver diseases. They've developed stigmata of decompensation, which basically means they have signs of liver failure. They may have fluid retention in their abdomen. They may have a gastrointestinal bleeding from varices. They may have recurrent infections related to the fluid buildup and the ascites. They may have jaundice, yellowing of their skin, or sclerolictris, yellowing of their eyes, hepatic encephalopathy, which is confusion from toxin buildup uh, going to the brain. These patients should be considered for transplant. Uh, we typically look at their blood work to help decide if they're at a stage for transplant, and we calculate what's called the sodium meld score, and if it's greater than or equal to 11, and if they have a child puke score, which is another calculation we use that's B or higher, that would fit uh, or the minimal criteria for transplant consideration. There's other more, or I should say less common indications for transplant that include a lung disease called hepatopulmonary syndrome, where you would get shortness of breath and, and low oxygen levels. And a hepatocellular carcinoma, as we already said, is another growing indication. Fulminant liver failure is a small group of patients we see, but does occur where patients are in uh, liver failure, but otherwise didn't have any previous history of liver disease. And they're often very sick and in the hospital by the point at, at the time where, where, where they meet the, the liver specialists. Metabolic disorders is seen more in pediatrics. And uh, I'm not going to go into more detail about that. We can go to the next slide. So to get referred as a patient, you want to ask your your physicians to send a referral to the Health Science Center. The hepatology department central intake will review the referral and bring you into our advanced liver clinics. The phone numbers are listed here and we have a fax number. And if you're deemed to be a transplant patient, potentially you would then be referred to the pre-liver transplant clinics. So steps in transplant assessment. Step one, your doctor sends a referral package to Health Science Center hepatology intake. Step two, if appropriate, the package will be forwarded to the Manitoba Transplant Wellness Center. Step three, you will be scheduled for an initial appointment in the transplant clinic. Step four, the transplant physician will decide if you will undergo testing to see if transplant is right for you. And then step five, following testing in Manitoba, you'll be required to travel to Toronto to complete your assessments. Getting on the liver transplant waiting list. So there's lots of indications that we've already talked about and you really have to weigh the, the risks of this surgery. So there's potential contraindications. As a general rule, there's very few absolute contraindications, but some are listed here, including malignancy outside of the liver or that cannot be controlled with medications, depending on nutritional status, if you're uh, extremely underweight and malnourished, or even if you're extremely overweight, uh, that may be a contraindication. <clears throat> and again, there's, there's other things, including heart disease or lung disease that may also preclude, preclude someone from being a candidate. And you need to have good social support system. Ongoing substance abuse is, is also certainly a contraindication to transplant. As far as indications, as we said, there's lots of them. 
and those include alcoholic liver disease, hepatocellular carcinoma, fulminant liver failure, metabolic diseases. Sometimes people require a second transplant. It's not a common event, but it does happen as we have kids who are transplanted sometimes into adulthood, they do require a second uh, organ at some point in their lifetime, or there may be some other reasons why they may need to have a second transplant. As we said, we do calculate the sodium ML score and we, we think about the sur survival benefit because this is a, a big surgery. Next slide. These are some contact numbers. If you or your loved ones need to contact the Winnipeg pre-transplant clinics or in Toronto, and they're listed here. And so as we said earlier, there's two pathways to transplant. Historically in the Western world, deceased donation was and continues to be the standard of care, but a growing number of patients qualify and pursue living donation. And that has certainly its advantages as far as minimizing wait times. Next slide. Deceased donor transplant patients are listed based on the criteria made by a Trillium Gift of Life Network. The organs are allocated based on where individuals are placed on the waiting list. And that's really done exclusively by their sodium ML score but they're also based on their blood type and body size. The sodium melt score is a, a really blood test. So it's very objective and it's uh, made up of uh, the numbers in the green box on the right of the screen, the total bilirubin, the creatinine, the INR, and then we add the serum sodium to calculate a number. And it typically goes between six and 40 with the higher number indicating uh, the person is uh, higher up on the wait list because they're sicker and they really need a transplant sooner. Usually because of our long wait times, patients don't uh, get called into transplant uh, until their sodium melt score is uh, well into the thirties. And so you have to be not only sick, but you have to be very sick. Unfortunately, with our long wait times, we do have patients dying on the waiting list anywhere between a quarter to a third of patients might uh, not make it to transplant. So just being on the transplant list does not guarantee that that individual will end up having a transplant. And so this is a emotionally difficult time for patients and their family. And it, it's very difficult to predict how things ultimately will end up just because of how sick people are. Next slide. When we consider patients for waiting for a liver transplant while you're on the waiting list, it's really important to maintain health. And that means you want to eat healthy, stay fit and, and, and ambulate as much as you can. Again, given the limitations of your ability to do that, because obviously you're, you're, you're still having, you're sick from your, from your liver illness. You want to, however, be in tune with your body and identify early if you have any illnesses or conditions while you're on the waiting list. You, need, you want to assess and treat any signs and symptoms of liver failure. So that means taking medications for your fluid buildup and encephalopathy. Make sure you keep your appointments with the transplant clinics. You should also make sure that you are up to date with your blood work. And that requires monthly blood work in order to stay active on the waiting list. There are other tests that expire if you're on the waiting list for a long amount of time that also will require to be repeated while you're waiting for the transplants. You do wanna notify your transplant coordinator immediately if anything changes from a health perspective, if you get admitted to, the, to a hospital, we do need to know about that so we can inform the program of where you are and where you stand. And while you're waiting, of course, we do remind patients, although it's not always possible to explore living liver donation, which as we said, would be a way to decrease the waiting times. And with that, I'll 
turn it back to Paula. Thank you, David. So living liver donation is a life-saving transplant and it has minimal wait time. It's a scheduled surgery. And that means that there's a potential for a faster return to good health, good quality of life and better outcomes. We also know that donors gain a deep satisfaction from saving a life. We hear from them uh, often. We know that it's a very, very meaningful thing that they do and, uh, and they often would like to share their experience with others. Living liver transplantation is very common in many parts of the world. And that may come as a surprise to many of us, but it, it, it was performed 6,600 times worldwide in 2020. So a relatively common procedure. And although it's common, it's also important to note that donor safety is our number one priority and that there are risks involved in living liver donation. And so we have developed a set of, of, of criteria in order to ensure that it is as safe as possible. So living donors typically are between the ages of 16 and 60. Most donors are slightly younger than, than 60, slightly older than 16. Many of them are in excellent physical and emotional health. You have to be in very good physical and emotional health in order to go through the assessment process. You need to have a normal liver function, be a healthy weight for your height, and we can provide assistance if you need to lose some weight, and some of our donors have done that. You also need to be, to be a blood match and a liver size match for your intended recipient. And so that is why we ask that you provide proof of blood type when you submit your form. It is also important that living donors receive some support from family and friends as they go through the process because recovery in particular can, can be a little bit challenging in the first few days, in the first couple of weeks in particular. And it, and it is important to have family and friends around you. And also in the, in the assessment uh, phase, it's always good to have someone there to also uh, help you with appointments or take you to appointments or be there as uh, someone to also hear the information. We always emphasize that living liver donation is a voluntary choice. And that is important. It's a choice that you must come to yourself based upon the information that you're receiving and whether you feel that this is something you want to do. So people who are younger than 16 and older than 60 are not eligible or not assessed at our, at our center. And this is because the liver takes some time to regenerate. <clears throat> and we wanna make sure that it is the safest possible for donors. We also reduced the age to 16 because we had a, a very persistent young donor who wanted to donate. It went through ethics approval at UHN, but we also want to ensure that consent is able to be provided. And so that is why we, we set the minimum age for 16. Anyone younger than that would not be able to donate. As well, there are a number of conditions that if you have them, makes it higher risk for you to be a donor. So if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, if you have a history of cancer, if you have a history of squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma, you can proceed with the evaluation, but not other types of cancer. Finally, there are a number of other things that we want to ensure don't become a problem during surgery. So if you have a history of heart bypass, heart attack, cardiac stents, or stroke, that is a contraindication to being a living donor. I mentioned BMI. BMI lower than 30 is preferred. If you don't know your BMI, there are a number of calculators that you can access online and would be able to help you determine what your BMI is. 
there is a weight loss program available for donors who would like to proceed with donation, but are between 30 and 35. We've had some donors that are above 35 that have successfully lost enough weight in order to proceed. But generally anyone that has a BMI over 35 would not be accepted for, for, for donation. There are additionally a number of factors that are identified during the donor assessment process. And so those then are taken into account and only a minority of people who, who apply to be a donor are able to proceed. So these are some practical considerations if you are exploring living liver donation. First of all, the donor team is separate from the recipient team. One donor is assessed at a time. So this means that if it's a situation that has some urgency but is not uh, of an urgent enough nature or the mouth score and other factors are not placing you high enough on the, the transplant priority, it's important to know that we are looking for donors that are, that are healthy and that we try to eliminate donors as quickly as possible so that we can proceed to the donor, to assessing donor, the donor that will ultimately be able to donate and save a life, which is the case for many of our patients. So the donor workup is four to six weeks in general. That can, that can be longer. That can be also shorter in very urgent situations. The tests are at the donor's convenience. Donors will need to travel to Toronto for imaging. And this is because the surgeon requires specific information in order to determine whether surgery is possible and whether it can be done safely for you. So from your application to surgery, it's about eight weeks. However, that can be shorter or longer as I noted. Manitoba Health covers the cost of testing and the surgery for the recipient and the living donor. And all living donors are also eligible for financial reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses. Not necessarily all expenses because travel and accommodation costs can be quite high. However, there are other supports available, including a program that the Center for Living Organ Donation has with Hope Air in order to cover any unfunded travel and accommodation for donors. So talk to the living donor social worker, talk to the team about LODERP and the other supports available. Donor surgery takes about seven hours. You will be admitted to hospital for between five and seven days. And donors generally return to work in six to eight weeks, sometimes longer. For many donors who have, who are able to use sick benefits at work, they will take the full three months. We do recommend that you plan for at least eight weeks, six to eight weeks to give your body time to recover. And if you have a job that requires heavy lifting, et cetera, you will need to take additional time, likely the full three months. The good news is that the liver grows back. There are risks to donor surgery and liver donation, but those are very mild for the most part. And our team has a lot of experience in addressing them quickly and successfully. So to become a living donor, there are really three steps and a lot goes into each of these three steps, but they're important steps. So the first one is to complete the donor health history form. This form is available on UHN Transplant on, on the UHN Transplant website. It is an extensive form. It's 12 pages long. The first 11 have a lot of questions. The last page has information on where to send the form to. So please review the questionnaire, answer the questions to the extent possible. Sometimes you may not remember and it's okay to put down that you don't remember. The purpose of this form is to 
allow the living donor coordinators to do a preliminary assessment to determine whether you might be a good candidate. Obviously, there is going to be a lot of tests that will be done, a lot of assessments, but we time is very valuable and it's very, very important that you be very, very honest about any kind of health condition because that will impact whether or not you might be an eligible candidate. And importantly, because only one donor is assessed at a time, we don't want to waste precious time for the transplant recipient in assessment of donors that ultimately may not be able to donate. One thing to remember is to include your blood type or proof of, of your blood type, such as a copy of the blood donor card. That is very, very important because it will allow the team to determine whether you have a compatible blood type with your intended recipient. Obviously, if you are uh, intending to donate anonymously or become a non-directed donor to someone in need, you will be matched with whoever requires it. But in the case where you are looking to donate to a specific recipient, it's particularly important to include your blood type and that you be compatible. If you're a likely match, you will receive a call from the living donor coordinator and they will review the health information in your form and they will start the process. The process is quite comprehensive and there are many team members who are involved all from their expert perspective to ensure that it is the safest possible decision for you. And then you will proceed to surgery if all is well. For donors or for transplant recipients, I should say, finding a liver donor is a bit of a, a, a challenge. It can be very stressful for families who have been told that they require a life-saving transplant and that the wait on the deceased donor wait list may be years. And so we also offer support to, to those who need a bit more information on how to go about sharing their need for a, a liver donor. So these are some resources that the Center for Living Organ Donation has developed. There was a recording that is available on our YouTube uh, channel, which specifically addresses how to find a living donor, how to begin the conversation. If you're considering a public campaign or sharing the information on social media, what are some of the considerations you need to take into account? And what are some of the practical steps that you would need to, to complete? So a lot of resources that we have, our YouTube channel, Give Life UHN, and also we offer regular events, regular workshops, seminars, et cetera, that will provide additional information. So we have a Tuesday series, which includes a session on how to find a living donor. And for Living Donation Week annually, we also offer a, a workshop on this topic. From a very practical point of view, when we talk to, to patients and families about how to begin the conversation, it's important that they consider talking first to their inner circle, their family and friends. And they, many in many cases, um, our patients tell us uh, that they simply share the information. They share their health status. They share their need for a transplant. And they share the fact that living liver transplant saves lives and that there are many people who have done this. And so uh, they, that sharing of information is important to continue on an ongoing basis. It can be, it can be via a regular email update. It can be through conversations at gatherings, which don't happen as frequently now, but are still happening. And it can also be in, in community settings where sharing that need with, with former classmates, with coworkers, in, in faith groups, in clubs, in teams, in your neighborhood. All of that means that you are reaching 
uh, a lot of people. And if you're considering launching a campaign, you're reaching even more people. Know that there are many people when you begin these discussions that will want to support you. Not everybody will want to or feel comfortable stepping forward to be assessed to become a living donor, but many people can help in other ways. They can share the need that you have with their own networks. They can drive you to appointments. They can talk to others about living donation. They can become informed. So many ways for many people to be a support to you. So these are some additional supports for you. The Center for Living Organ Donation is there if you are exploring living liver transplantation or living liver donation. You can contact us. We'll provide you with information on the process, on the risks, on some of the factors to consider if you're just in the early stages. And then following your procedure will also be there in case you would like to help others along the way. We know that peer mentorship is helpful to those who are going through the process. It often helps to talk to somebody who's been through a transplant or who's been through a, who's become a liver donor, but it's also very helpful to be a mentor. Mentorship is, is a very, very beneficial for many people. It, it helps to know that you're part of a community and that you're helping others. And so we provide peer mentorship programs as well. Importantly, when donors submit the donor health history form and it, they are in assessment, the Living Liver Donor Office is the place that they should be contacting, is the place that will provide information on upcoming appointments, will manage the whole process for them. So the Center for Living Organ Donation is when you're in the early stages and after the procedure, the Living Liver Donor Office is during the assessment process as you're having all kinds of appointments in order to determine whether it would be safe for you to proceed with surgery. It's also important, I should add before I turn it over to Cheryl, that we, that we cannot provide information to the recipient on the status of the living donor assessment. That is because the teams are separate and each team is focused on their own patients. So the, the, the recipient team is focused exclusively on the transplant recipient. The donor team is focused exclusively on the, the donor, the donor candidate. So I would now like to turn it over to Cheryl to talk to you about the exciting part, which is what happens when you get the call. Cheryl. Thank you, Paula. So my name is Cheryl. I'm one of the nurse coordinators with the liver program at the Ishmael Transplant Center. So as Paula has mentioned, we're on to what happens when you get the call. So this is different whether you are proceeding with a deceased donor transplant or a living donor transplant. With our living donor transplant recipients, the surgery itself is scheduled. So you do have a timeline when you will be traveling to Toronto for surgery and what your expected stay will be. That is not the case with a deceased donor. So what happens when an organ becomes available and is allocated to you as the recipient? One of our nurses, we refer to them as the multi-organ transplant coordinators. So they are on call 24-7. They receive the information and reach out to you. So they will call you on cell phone, home phone, your, your loved one's cell phones if we have that information. So it's important that you keep that information up to date with the Winnipeg patient, or sorry, with the Winnipeg transplant program, and also with the Toronto program if you are on the waiting list. As David alluded to earlier, we do communicate with Winnipeg routinely and frequently. So as long as you're contacting one of the programs, the information should get to where it needs to be. So that phone call, as it says, can come anytime, day, night, weekends, holidays, so it's important that if you are traveling, if you are going to be out of service for a period of time, 
and that you notify us that you may not be available, whether it be for the day, whether it be for the weekend, we do know life still continues to happen. So we just ask that you let us know if you are going to be away. As Paula alluded to as well, time is the most important thing. So we will continue to call or attempt to call you for approximately an hour. We will leave messages at all the numbers we have. If we are unable to contact you within that allotted time, we will move on to the next most appropriate recipient. So it's important that you let us know when and if you are not available for, to, for a call for transplant. When we do call you, we'll ask you screening questions. Those will include, have you had any recent changes to your health, any recent hospitalizations? Are you current with your vaccinations? So the Ishmael Transplant Program does require at least two COVID vaccinations right now, as well as other recommended vaccinations. So you will be asked a series of questions to ensure that it is safe for you to travel, that it is safe for us to proceed with transplant. Next slide, please. If all of the answers to those questions are make it an acceptable risk to bring you or, or your, you can travel, we'll bring you to Toronto. So we'll discuss with you on a case-by-case -case basis. We know when we call you, you're in Manitoba. So we know you can't be to us within an hour and that's okay. So we do use Hope Air. We do use Life Flight. These are some of the... Um, services available to us to help get you to Toronto. And that will be discussed with the coordinator who calls you. You will, however, be responsible to pay for a cab from the airport. It could be Pearson, it could be Billy Bishop. So it's important that you front, you will be required to pay for that when you get to Toronto and land and get to the hospital. We acknowledge that weather and traffic sometimes limit the availability of air travel. So sometimes those things will need, need to be taken into consideration, as well as ground travel within Toronto. So if you've landed, there's a snowstorm, it's going to take you longer to get to the hospital. We do ask that you just contact our inpatient unit at the number on the screen, just to keep us up to date that you are on your way, but that you've been delayed. Sometimes and there's no amount of preparation or good way we can prepare patients for this, but they do come to Toronto, get admitted to hospital, and for one reason or another, the surgery is canceled. This is first and foremost for your benefit because it means that either we have initially an organ that we thought would be healthy enough after further review by our surgical team, after samples have been sent to the lab, we've decided that it is not a safe organ to use. So at that time, unfortunately, the surgery would be canceled, you would be informed by our team, and you would be sent home. In that case, it is your responsibility to arrange travel to return home. However, as it's mentioned here, Manitoba Health will reimburse all or most of that. So it's important that you keep receipts and boarding passes for that trip back to Manitoba. You will remain active on the waiting list. And uh, again, we'll go through that process of being called in when the next suitable organ becomes available for you. <clears throat> it's also important that when you come to Toronto, we reiterate during your workup, having a support person is important. So we want to make sure that that person comes with you when you come to Toronto so that you have someone here with you. And then again, keep all of those receipts for any accommodations because that person will need to have somewhere to stay and we can help with that as well. Provided the organ is suitable and safe to go ahead, we'll proceed with surgery. Surgery takes anywhere from five to eight hours. And then following that, you will stay in hospital anywhere from 10 to 14 days. Most of our patients go to our ICU or our step-down unit for the first day or two while we continue to monitor everything, ensure that the, the new liver is working well. And then you would go to a regular inpatient unit where from there you would receive some education, some support, learn your new medications, and then we would discharge you from there stable stay in when you go home 
and they get removed within two or three weeks after surgery. So that would happen back in Manitoba. And then, of course, if you are, are 25, your recovery may be a little easier than if you are 55. Some of that depends on how sick you are going into surgery. Some of that depends on your overall physical fitness and status going into surgery. But for the most part, most people will recover um, within six to six to eight weeks. You'll see that the pain has decreased, your mobility has increased back to baseline, and you're feeling almost back to normal, hopefully better. <clears throat> so when you return home, the expectation is when you're discharged from Toronto Hospital, that your return flight home potentially could be on a commercial airline. So that would be up to you to arrange that for yourself and your support person. Again, keeping those receipts for potential reimbursement. Um, what will be arranged for you will be follow up with the Winnipeg transplant program prior to us sending you home so that you want that and you've got a follow up appointment with the team there just to make sure that there's no gaps in, in care post transplant. If there's some concerns about your health before, and we want to send you back to Manitoba, sometimes there's infections that we're treating, sometimes getting up and moving around requires some physiotherapy or rehab. We do have a mechanism where we would transfer you from our hospital back to hospital in Winnipeg so that you can get stronger, have infections treated, and get suitable to be discharged home from there. So we would try not to keep you here in Toronto any longer than we have to. We understand it's expensive for your loved ones, and it's always harder to get better when you're away from home. So life after transplant. Obviously, we transplant patients because we think your survival benefit is greater than without transplant. Having said that, it does require some life changes. So we want you to stay safe, but enjoy life. So just because you've had a transplant shouldn't put huge limitations on your what you're able to do and enjoy in life. So along with you, the transplant team in Toronto and, and primarily in Winnipeg, continue to monitor for rejection and infection, other complications. So that includes doing routine blood work, so as David alluded to, while you're waiting for transplant, you're doing it monthly. After transplant, you're doing it a little bit more frequently at first. And then that uh, evens out to some routine blood work. So we can monitor the function of the new liver. Part of what we're also monitoring is medication levels. So everyone goes on essentially the same immunosuppression medications. However, everyone requires a little bit different regime and different doses. So we'll be monitoring that through your blood work as well. And we'll be communicating with you as to what your individual doses and medications need to be. Regular checkups, as we've already mentioned, and healthy lifestyle. So that means ensuring that uh, you're getting your uh, vaccinations, uh, flu vaccinations, um, pneumonia vaccinations, Again, who knows where COVID vaccinations are going to go in the future, but ensuring that you're up to date and that you're making choices that are going to ensure the longevity of the graft that you've received and your health. And again, all, you can always speak to the transplant team in Winnipeg about your particular case and, and whether it's safe to you and recommended for you to continue to receive any of those further vaccinations. And then mental health. So dealing with chronic illness before transplant can often have effects on our mental health. And then post-transplant comes with some challenges as well. As you adjust to your new medication re regime, you're fatigued initially. So really reaching out to those around you for support. And again, discussing it with your transplant team in Winnipeg. If you feel that you require additional support, definitely we can help, help you resource those. And then for medications, as I mentioned, you're going to go home on a whole new set of medications. We do have a resource available through the website, and it's 
It's been developed through the transplant outpatient pharmacy, so top pharmacy. So if you have questions about specific medications when you go home or you don't remember what we told you, maybe it's it's 11 o'clock at night and there's no one in the office, you can always access this website and, and get some general information about the majority of the most common transplant medications that you potentially could be on after transplant. So it's a great resource. And then also during during the week, Monday to Friday, typically there would be someone in the liver transplant clinic in Manitoba that you could also reach out to if you need additional information or you're having side effects from medications. We can always review those and look at alternatives for you. So just two resources here for you. And then as far as further information from our, our presentation today, the Transplant Manitoba Gift of Life is the provincial body for Manitoba. So you can always reach out to them to get additional information about transplant in general. And then as Paula has mentioned, the Center for Living Do Organ Donation is always available for any information on our living donor program in Toronto, as well as how to start that process and what that process looks like or how it differs from a deceased donor transplant. Also, the manuals, there's a separate manual for both recipients and for donors. There's some information about surgery, as well as additional information and the websites there. So through the UHN transplant website, or there's also a website that has access to the library that looks at some of the different resources and surgery guides for recipients and for donors. Thank you, Cheryl. That was a very, very comprehensive presentation. And thank you, David, for your presentation on liver transplantation and indications for liver transplantation. We hope that this webinar has been helpful to you. If you require any information, please contact the Center for Living Organ Donation and we would be happy to help you. So in closing, thank you to our speakers, Cheryl Berrio and David Peretz, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>